chapter 36. You know, this is the first time that I will pick up information from so many chapters in one study, eight chapters. I want to tell you this is the nature of the book of Jeremiah. The message is spread out. There's a continuation of many themes that are sprinkled over a large body of verses. Of course, one cannot cover all the elements of these chapters in just 45 minutes, but many of the themes presented here cannot be fairly dealt with by confining ourselves to one or two chapters. And well, in this section, historical chronology is not always followed. There is a clear order of events that bring out the main, main message. This is what makes this book exceptionally fascinating. I want to tell you, Jeremiah is killing me because I have to read a lot. But this is a great book to study. What is the prominent message here in this long section of Jeremiah? You know, as Israel is about to experience what is to be a major event in her history, where she will cross over into the diaspora, into the dispersion, which the Jews will experience until the second coming of the Messiah, the high-flying message is what's called uh, Kosderol. To begin with, this is the nature of men. This is the message. Men can be good, but he can also be really bad. Especially, and this is the main theme here, especially when he is without God. When he rejects all parameters of what is right and true and begins to make up his own. And more so when at the same time when the walls are closing in on him. Then his behavior becomes incomprehensible as he's all over the place and really he is nowhere because the foundation, the source of his being has been rejected. Remember what God said in Jeremiah 31, 33, how strong he was about his promises on Israel. Okay? And then in chapter 39, he actually, the Babylonians come and destroy Israel. What happened in between? How come he's giving us this, these chapters in between? He wants to show us the nature of man himself. You know, while we're going to read about the strength of the Babylonians and about the many cities they conquered and about so many other things, what these chapters tell us at the end is that without God, we are completely lost. This section can be paired with the book of Revelation. There we are told what men will do at the end without God. We read of wars and wars without end. And here in Jeremiah, we are told how man is, how he acts, how he thinks, given the same situation, and in both cases, he ends in failure. And on the practical side, this is a truth we find at all levels of man's life, our life as a community as much as our personal lives. After reading this section, it would be fair to say that the roots of most of our problems as believers could be localized somewhere in the past, Somewhere at a time where we have begun to lose our first love. Where we have begun to lose contact with God. It is so easy, I want to tell you, to slip away. And the slipping away happens so subtly, we barely realize it until it takes us over. And so this section is here, not really to tell us how bad things can be, because we've read about them for the last 35 chapters. This section will leave you with a sense, with an excitement for a truly possible stronger relationship with God because he's there all over the place or for a possible re renewed relationship with him because one thing that comes out of it is that God is always present. He never left. We actually often leave him and forget about him. But know that he's always there for you so it is my prayer that we will come out of this study with a desire and urge to fully go back to him and to renew our strength in him. Now let's begin to take a look at the very last king of Judah. Much is said about him. The last representative of Israel before her fall, King Zedekiah. This man is here a prototype of what man becomes when he literally invites evil to strike his life. Let's begin with Je uh, Jeremiah 37. Let's read verses 1 to 3. Where well, there's a quite revealing introduction to this whole matter. By the way, there's 
things that happen between verse 2 and 3. In fact, you're going to see they don't match. So now King Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, reigned instead of Coniah, the son of Joachim, from Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, made king in the land of Judah. But neither he nor his servants nor the people of the land gave heed to the words of the Lord, which he spoke by the prophet Jeremiah. And Zedekiah the king sent Jehuchal, the son of Shelemiah, and Zephaniah, the son of Messiah, the priest, to the prophet Jeremiah, saying, Pray now to the Lord our God for us. Can you make sense of these three verses? There is a disparity between God and man, a lack of communication somehow between verse 2 and 3. First, let's look at verse 1. The three last kings of Israel are mentioned, Coniah, Joachim, and Zedekiah. These are three brothers, the three musketeers, if you want, of rebellion and silliness. Josiah was their father. Each contributed to the fall of Judah. We remember back in Jeremiah 22 that with Coniah or Jeconiah, same name, the lineage of David through Solomon stopped. God said that no descendant from this man will sit on the throne of David. Joseph, by the way, do you know that the husband of Mary is a descendant of this man? This man is mentioned in the genealogy of Matthew. So if Jesus would have been the real son of Joseph, he could not have been the Messiah. So God, God resolved this by the virgin birth, Matthew 1.18. In addition of having Mary being descendant of David through another son. In Luke 3, through Nathan. The other king, Jehoiakim, is another king that is mentioned here for something terrible that he did. But we will see later in this study. But Zedekiah gets the gold medal. There are few men in the Bible that are so volatile, so naive, and so worried about their self-image and about what others would say about them than this man. This very section is about him. Let me bring you to a couple of situations where we seem to be completely out of touch with reality. Yet on him rested actually the fate of the people of Judah. Notice that verse 2 states that he himself, nor his servant, nor the people of the land gave heed to the words of the Lord. This is the introduction to this section. It is like a title because many times in this chapter it would appear that this man really sought God, but it was not true. His seeking was for self-satisfaction. And here we read one of his many inquiries. The last words of verse 3, he asked Jeremiah, saying, Pray now to the Lord our God for us. It sounds good, right? Until you realize when and at what time he asked this question and what he did afterwards. As we have begun to see last week, Chapter 37, Babylonians actually were surrounding Jerusalem. Zedekiah panics and he asks God for help, as we see here. So God answers him and tells him that the best thing for him now is to give himself to the Babylonian and his fate will not be as bad. But when he learns that the Egyptians are coming to the rescue, he forgets completely about God. He resists the Babylonian and he makes that mistake that stamped the awful fate of Israel. Part of God's answer to his prayer is found in verse 9. <clears throat> says, Thus says the Lord, Do not deceive yourself, saying the Chaldeans or the Babylonians will surely depart from us, for they will not depart. But Zedekiah does not listen and waits for the Egyptians who really are no help. And the Babylonians did come back. Did he come back to destroy Jerusalem? Pray now to the Lord, our God, for us. Did he really mean what he said? No, he didn't. Let's look further. And while Zedekiah waited for the Egyptian, another situation develops. At some point, Jeremiah needed to leave Jerusalem for some business. But he is stopped and arrested by an officer who accused him of defecting to the Babylonians. This we read in verse 11 to 15 of the same chapter. And as a consequence, he is jailed. But what is surprising is King Zedekiah's behavior. Look at verse 16 and 17, after the arrest. 
It says, when Jeremiah entered the dungeon and the cells, and Jeremiah had remained there many days, then Zedekiah the king sent and took him out. The king asked him secretly in his house and said, is there any word from the Lord? Is there any word from the Lord for me? He did not care to have actually the prophet of God arrested and gagged. All he cared was about himself. Yet there was an answer given to him, the same as before. Verse 17, he says, and Jeremiah says, there is, there is an answer. Then he says, you shall be delivered into the hand of the king of Babylon. That's not you. He said it already. But that's not all. As time goes on, and as things become worse in Jerusalem, this man becomes even more irrational in that he gradually becomes oblivious to the reality around him, to the danger of the situation. It is in the next chapter, Jeremiah 38. Somehow Jeremiah was freed, but other officers noticed that Jeremiah's prophecies were disturbing and discouraging the people around. Look at verse 4. Here they realize, we realize, by the way, how God became so far from Israel, became a stranger. Verse 4 says, Therefore the princess said to the king, Please let this man be put to death. For thus he weakens the hands of men of war who remain in the city, and the hands of all the people by speaking such words to them, by speaking the word of God. This is what it says. It says, For this man, Jeremiah, does not seek his welfare, that is the welfare of his people, but their harm. This is when God is seen as an enemy. This is when God is seen as the one who disturbs our comfort. And here Jeremiah is arrested a second time, but this time actually he's condemned to death. So he is brought to Zedekiah, who does nothing, but hands him over to his accuser, who put him into a pit, as we're going to see next week, into a well full of mud, where he was left to die, if it was not for the intervention of an Ethiopian, who later brought him up and saved him from a sure death. And again, once freed, Zedekiah's behavior is incomprehensible. Look at verse 13 to 14. So he said, so he pulled Jeremiah up with ropes and lifted him up out of the dungeon. And Jeremiah remained in the court of the prison. Then Zedekiah the king sent and had Jeremiah the prophet brought to him at the third entrance of the house of the Lord. And the king said, Jeremiah, I will ask you something. Hide nothing from me. By the way, that's the third time. After all these things, Zedekiah somehow doesn't see any objection to ask a revelation from God. As if he was completely clean, as if he, was, he had no need of repentance, as if all was good. Such was the leader, the last leader of Israel. Had nothing from me, he asked Jeremiah, but he did not realize that Jeremiah had told him over and over what would happen to him. Jeremiah at this point answers him in verse 15. He says, if I declare to you, will you not surely put me to death? And if I give you advice, will you not listen to me? Stop asking, Zedekiah. You will not listen anyway. But God is good. And look at the answer, verse 17 to 18. He repeats the same thing again. Then Jeremiah said to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, you will surely surrender to the king of Babylon's princes. Then your soul shall live, the city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. But if you do not surrender to the king of Babylon's princes, then this city shall be given into the hand of the Chaldeans. They shall burn it with fire, and you shall not escape from their hands. This is redundant, right? We heard this so many times, but maybe, who knows? Zedekiah could have accepted at this point, but he did not. Zedekiah requests are like the requests, if you remember, of the Pharisees asking the Messiah for another miracle after they overtly rejected him. And after that, the Messiah did all the possible miracles that they were expecting, then they came back to him. If you remember, in Matthew 12, verse 38, then some of the scribes and Pharisees answered and said, Teacher, we want to see a sign from you as if he didn't do anything before. But he answered and said to them, An evil and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and no sign will be given to an except the sign of the prophet Jonah. 
As for Jonah, who was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The miracle of Jonah that Jesus is speaking about was his death and resurrection, the only solution to all of this, the only solution to the evil of man. To the Israelites of the time of Jeremiah, their rejection resulted in the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple and brought the first diaspora. At the time of Jesus, their rejection also resulted with another destruction of Jerusalem and the temple. And so the second diaspora occurred. Man, I want to tell you, has not changed and the future is the same as the past was. This is what the prophecies are telling us. And it is in the following verse of Jeremiah 38, 19, where more of the true colors of this man Zedekiah are clearly revealed. See his answer in verse 19. After that, Jeremiah almost convinced him to give himself to the Babylonians and to save many lives. See the reason he gives for not giving to God, his life to God. It says, And Zedekiah the king said to Jeremiah, I'm afraid of the Jews who have defected to the Chaldeans, lest they deliver me into their hands and they abuse me. He was afraid of the Jews, that is of the Judeans that already went to the Babylonians. But why was he afraid of these particular people? The truth is that he, he, he was less scared of the Babylonians and even less of God than being abused by his fellow Jews. But do you know what the word abuse means in Biblical Hebrew? The word ralal means to make fun of, to be mistreated, to be mocked. What hunted this man was his self-image, more than the fate of the people of Israel. He was afraid to be made fun of. Zedekiah forgot that he was the king of Judah. He was not concerned for others, but only for his own skin. The exact opposite to what the true king will be, right? Do you see where this is going? And just before these events, see how he got so excited as he promises that if Jeremiah speaks to him about the future, he will protect him from anyone. Look at verse 16 of chapter 38. It says, So Zedekiah the king swore secretly to Jeremiah, saying, As the Lord lives, who made every soul, I will not put you to death, nor will I give you into the hand of these men who seek your life. But after this, after this conversation where he realized that he was not getting what he wanted, See what he says in verse 24. Then Zedekiah said to Jeremiah, Let no one know of these words, and you shall not die. He just promised him protection. After all, he is the king and he can provide this protection. But then again, he changes his mind and reneges his promises and says to Jeremiah, If you speak, you will die. Jeremiah's life depended on his silence. The king did not care about God or the people of Israel, he thought only of himself. Now do you see what kind of leadership was at the head of the state of Israel of the time? Now we can understand why this whole section began with such an affirmation of God's promises to Israel and his promises to have the Messiah rule over Israel. Do you remember what God said? Jeremiah 33, 20 to 21, I will read it for you which really opens up this section for us. He says, Thus says the Lord, you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night, so that there will be no day and night in their season. Then my covenant may also be broken with David, my servant, so that he shall not have a son to raid on his throne. And with the Levites, the priests, my ministers. How much do we need the Messiah to come and to rule this earth? Because the Decaia, again, is a prototype of those, these leaders who are only looking for their own selves. Now I understand why God went out of his way to promise that the Abrahamic covenant and the Davidic covenant will never be broken. Because left into the hands of men like this, we will go nowhere. Here then is the truth behind the fall of men. It is the nature of men. Chapter 38 is really the last chapter of God's offer to Israel because chapter 39 speaks of the fall of Jerusalem. I believe that all these things, all these incidents are given here so to prepare the Israelite and every other person to see and to receive the Messiah. To see 
the need that every man has of a mediator. While men may tell you, Yeshua, the Son of God, I want to tell you, will never fail you. He is the same today, yesterday, and forever, and there is no wavering with him. He is the rock that is immovable, and his love is truth. But I want to tell you that Zedekiah is not alone. Can you think of another person, by the way, in the Bible that is as wavering as Zedekiah? Do you remember Reuben? Reuben, the firstborn of Jacob. I want to bring this person because there's a lot of relation with Zedekiah. You know, in the book of Judges, you know, as the tribes of Israel got together to protect the land, you know that Reuben did not go. And what was his reason? See Judges 5.16. You will recognize Zedekiah in there. This is what Deborah, the prophetess, says to him. He says, why did you sit among the sheepfolds to hear the sound of the flocks? The division of Reuben's have great searching of heart. You know, there's irony here. While the others were at war, while others were working, Reuben stayed home and listened to the sound of the flock. And when listening to them, he had, it says, great searching of heart. If we didn't know better, we may have thought that this man was in a deep, was a deep spiritual being. This word searching in Hebrew always connotes a diligent, a difficult problem, probing. A word often mentioned in wisdom literature. But the truth is that this man could not make up his mind at a time when it was really not difficult to make a decision. There are situations that require deep probing of the heart, and there are others that do not require much thinking. And this is where discipline comes to play. In the Bible, the disciplined person is the one who works to be always in touch with God and to know what to do. Like Paul says, do not be silly and know what the will of the Lord is. In both instances, with Reuben as, as with Zedekiah, they both lost this connection because they were more consumed with themselves than with what needed to be done. In both instances, the country was at war. Both had the power to help, but both did not care for the other, but only for themselves. And these two men share more than just their unstable character. It really should have been from these two men, do you know that the Messiah should have come? Both of their lineage would have been the Messianic line, but both lost this great position because of their selfishness. Reuben was the firstborn of Jacob. It would have been from him that the messianic light would have come. But he did not do it. He committed a hideous crime in going with his father's concubine. His two next brothers did sin also, Shimon and Levi. They also lost their, lost their rights. And the fourth, Judah, was chosen to be the messianic tribe. This tribe, from them came the Messiah. Reuben lost it. Zedekiah comes from Judah, and he was a direct descendant of David and Solomon. He would have been the one to carry the seed, but he also lost it because of selfishness. Selfishness, by the way, is precisely what biblical Christianity stands against. You know, there's a Jewish proverb that rightly says, there's no room for God in man who is full of himself. What selfishness is, is the trinity of the me, myself, and I. And I want to tell you, we often organize these parties and we invite the me, myself, and I. This is the Rubens the Kaya's party. You know, when, when, do you, when do we organize these parties? Of course, we organize this party when we are consumed with ourselves. We organize these parties when we feel the world does not recognize all that we do for them and for God. We feel bad for ourselves because we deserve, we believe we deserve much better. We organize this body when we really have lost sight of our God to whom we ought to work for and for whom we should get all our rewards. And I want to tell you who is the complete opposite of this trinity of self, because in him is the trinity of love. Remember, for the love of others, God has severed himself and he came to die for, the, for people who were enemies to him. 
there's a mark, there's a great contrast in there. And today the whole Trinity, divine Trinity is engaged in protecting us. The Spirit in us, the Messiah pleading for us at the right hand of God who forgives our sins. This is what is contrary to selfishness. Now let us go see the other king, Jehoiakim. Because of what he has done, his name surfaces here just before the very end. Because his action is similar, I want to tell you, to the blasphemy against the Spirit of God. See what he did. Let's turn to Jeremiah 36. Here we're going to see an almost national repentance. But the situation ended up worse than what it was initially. At this time, God asked Jeremiah to write his word into a scroll and to go and read it to the people. See verse 4 and 5. It says, Then Jeremiah called Baruch, the son of Neriah, and Baruch wrote on a scroll of a book, at the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of the Lord which he has spoken to him. And Jeremiah commanded Baruch, saying, I am confined, I cannot go into the house of the Lord. You know, this last verse, verse 5, tell us how bad the relationship between God and the nation ended up to be. Because the prophet of God by this time could not go into the temple anymore. He could not enter the house of God. God finds himself in the same situation as with the church, if you remember, of Laodicea, where he is seen outside knocking at the door of his own place. Same history. In both cases, he writes them a letter, his word. And at the time of Jeremiah, Baruch is sent. Baruch was Jeremiah's scribe. His name means blessed, as is everyone who carries the word of God to the unsaved. And this letter that he carried did have much effect on many people. In fact, there were three readings of this letter. The two first ones were great. The third one angered the king. Let's see the first reading, verses 9 and 10. It says, Now it came to pass in the fifth year of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, in the ninth month, that they proclaim a fast before the Lord to all the people in Jerusalem and to all the people who came from the cities of Judah to Jerusalem. Then Baruch read from the book of the words of Jeremiah in the house of the Lord, in the chamber of Gemariah, the son of Shaphan, the scribe, in the upper court of the entry of the new gates of the Lord's house, in the hearing of all the people. They all heard the word of God, and some of them were so touched by the reading of the scriptures that they brought Baruch to the officials of the temple so that he could read it again. This is what we find in verses 14 and 15. It says, Therefore all the princes and sent Yehudi, the son of Nathania, the son of Shelemiah, the son of Cushi, to Baruch, saying, Take in your hand the scroll from which you have read in the hearing of the people and come. So Baruch, the son of Nerea, took the scroll in his hand and came to them. And they said to him, sit down now and read it to our hearing. So Baruch read it to their hearing. This is so exciting, isn't it? Do you see of all these people, this is people who were listening to the word of God? And even the spirit of God, I believe, got out of his way to mention the names of many of them, especially as we see in verse 12. They were there, they heard, they realized its power. And after reading these words, we read in verse 16, it says, Now it happened when they had heard the words of God that they looked in fear, it says, from one another and said to, Bar to Baruch, We will surely tell the king of these words. They were scared. They got feared. They feared because of the prophecies. And the logical thing is to do was to bring it to the king who actually had the power to change things. You see, they were almost there. Okay, they were almost there. There And it is when they brought it to the king that the whole nation was condemned by his action. Look at these are very sad verses, verses 22 to 23. See what he does with the word of God. It says, Now the king was sitting in the winter house in the ninth month with a fire burning in the hearth before him. And it happened when Yehudi had read three or four columns that the king cut it with scribe's knife, and he cast it into the fire. So after reading three or four columns, he does not only 
burned the scroll, but he's so angry at the word of God that he cuts it first with a knife. What a tragedy. That also, I want to tell you, sealed the faith of Israel. See what happened when man is without God. It is interesting that the burning happened after he tells us that he read three or four columns. Why, why is this mentioned? Why three or four columns? Why these numbers here? You know, this reminds us, if you remember, the prophecy of Amos, who also spoke of the same judgment to Israel and to Judah. And there eight times the Lord repeated the same numbers. There he said, Amos 2, 6, he says, For three transgression of Israel and for four, I will not turn away its punishment. The repetition is made for each of the nations surrounding Israel. The last was Israel. The use of number three, shalosh, is often used in the scriptures as an infinite number. Remember these expressions as, for example, in First Chronicle when it says, also in time past, when Saul was a king, the words in time past, shilshom, literally means three days ago. Meaning, in an undetermined past time. Even when Moses, remember in Exodus 3.18, when he goes to Pharaoh, he says, let us go three days journey into the wilderness so that we may sacrifice to the Lord our God. He did not mean three days exactly. He meant for an undetermined lapse of time forever in this case. And Pharaoh understood. This is why he didn't let him go. And the number three may show us the limitness for giving power of God. But that one that is added to make four shows us that perhaps our action, men's action, can decide to stop this power to come into us. Perhaps at the three columns Joachim heard, he was almost convinced, but at the fourth, he cut it and he burnt it. We cannot add to the word of God. We cannot add nothing to the work of the Lord except to be privileged to be part of it. The moment we think we can make it by ourselves, the moment we think we can do without God, in the fourth time, there's nothing left. We can block, actually, the blessings from God. We can block the whole thing in adding to his things. For three transgression of anyone, God will forgive. But at the fourth, at our refusal, he will not turn away his punishment. Joachim refused the call of God in making void his word. And see that the word of God will not leave anyone impassive. It will save you or it will anger you. This is what it does. See the sad conclusion in the next verse, 24. Yet, it says, they were not afraid. Yet, they were not afraid. You know, comes a time when man may reach a point where his conscience is completely seared. Seared with a hot iron, like Paul says in 1 Timothy 4. This is when they cut the word and they burn it. When people do not fear anymore, when they think they are invisible, in, invincible, this is when they fall. Someone said that there are millions of North Americans who are clever and fearless. They are four years old. As the Decayan and the other king are. But these men did not fear and they proudly boasted about what they had. They proudly boasted against God and two verses later, the king issued an arrest warrant against Jeremiah and Baruch. But God hid them, it says. He thought he mastered the situation, but it was only boasting. This is the nature of man. This is what I believe. This chapter went inserted right there before we go into chapter 39 and then before we go into the judgment of all the nations of the world. You know, I read an illustration that Reminds me of the boasting of those who push away God from their lives. It was about a salesman selling vacuum cleaners who knocked on the door of a remote farmhouse. So when the lady of the house opened the door, he walked in and dumped a bag of dirt on the floor. Now boasted the salesman, I want to make a bargain with you. If this super duper new vacuum cleaner doesn't pick up every bit of this dirt, I will eat what's left. Here's a spoon, said the farmer's wife. I don't have electricity. <laughs> anything that is not of God is at the end for nothing. Right? 
It was Paul who said in, in 2 Corinthians 1.12, he said, For our boasting is this, the testimony of our conscience, that we conducted ourselves in the world in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but with the grace of God, and more abundantly towards you. There's work in there. There's discipline, right? On and on. If you want to sell vacuum cleaners, make sure you have electricity to make it work. Make sure that when... You do the work of God, make sure you have the Spirit of God with you so that you can do great things. And when Joachim cut the scroll and burnt it, by the way, did we lose any words of God? Of course not. Because Jeremiah was commanded to write, to rewrite it, and even to add more things to it. Look at verse 32. It says, Then Jeremiah took another scroll and gave it to Baruch, the scribe, the son of Neriah, who wrote on it, at the instruction of Jeremiah, all the words of the book was Joachim, king of Judah, had burnt in the fire. And besides, there were added to them many similar words. Perhaps what was added was the judgment of those who burnt the word. But I want to tell you that we can cut, we can burn by many Bibles, but no one could never destroy the word of God. What did Jesus say? Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall never pass away. God says in Isaiah 48, The grass withers and the flowers fall, but the word of God stands forever. Today the word of God is in many ways and forms being cut and burned. This is similar to the mistreatment, by the way, of the Son of Man who is still despised, rejected, and crucified. This somehow is tolerated until the last Drop the fourth number. See, the Messiah, Messiah says in Matthew 12, Therefore I say to you, every sin and blasphemy will be forgiven men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit will not be forgiven men. Anyone who speaks a word against the Son of Man, it will be forgiven, but whoever speaks against the Holy Spirit, it will not be forgiven, either in this age or the age to come. What it means to speak against the Holy Spirit is to refuse the constant appeals of the Holy Spirit who is given in this world because of sin, because of righteousness, and because of judgment. When man refuses all his attempts, just like Zedekiah and the other king, then this is like committing the sin against the Holy Spirit. The sin against the Holy Spirit resulted in both instances, the time of Jesus and Zedekiah to the destruction again of the first and second temple. It was then a national rejection of the call of God through His Spirit. On the individual level again, this sin is committed when a person completely and repeatedly rejects the call of God. While there are many more things in this section we do not have time to cover today, but we will in the next weeks. Today I want to conclude with something. I want to tell you a great, great chapter. Chapter 39. No, not the first part. The second part, right? The first verses speak of the destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple. It speaks also of something really terrible, of the blinding of King Zedekiah. So Nebuchadnezzar blinded him after that he killed his son. The last sight that he had actually was the death of his son. But it doesn't stop there and thank God, right? Because even during these times of tribulation, God, I want to, take, I want to tell you, takes great care of his own. Beginning in verse 11, in the midst of the judgment, he first makes sure that Jeremiah is taken care of because it was a chaotic over there. Look at verse 11 and 12. It says, Now Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, gave charge concerning Jeremiah to Nebuzarandan, the captain of the guard, of saying, Take him and look after him and do him no harm, but do to him just as he says to you. Now, I want to tell you, this is something. We are talking about a barbarous people who are now caring for somebody. And see how the Lord comes into action here? See also chapter 40, verse 4. Now, this is Nebuzaradan, the great warrior who speaks here. He becomes so nice. He says, and now look, he speaks to Jeremiah. I free you this day from the chains that were on your hand. If it seems good to you to come with me to Babylon, come, and I will look after you, 
And if it seems wrong for you to come with me to Babylon, remain there. See, all the land is before you, wherever it seems good and convenient for you to go, go there. I want to tell you this is a miracle. God turned a, a cruel soldier into a caring brother. God does that. Next week we'll see perhaps why, what was behind his decision to do that. And what we see here is that God remember also another person. You know, if you recall, just before this time, Jeremiah was thrown into a pit and left to die. And it was a Cushat, an Ethiopian, who saved him. And God remembered him. Look at verse 15 to 18, how beautiful this is. It says, Meanwhile, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah while he was shut up in the court of the prison, saying, Go and speak to Ebed Melech, the Ethiopian, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, Behold, I will bring my words upon this city for adversity and not for good, and they shall be performed in that day before you, but I will deliver you in that day, says the Lord, and you shall not be given into the hands of the men of whom you are afraid. For I will surely deliver you, and you shall not fall by the sword, but your life shall be as a prize to you, because you have put your trust in me, says Jehovah. You know, I find it very comforting to find these verses right in the midst of what could be one of the most terrible time in the history of Israel. Practically, the least we can say is that God is truly looking after those who have committed their lives to Him, after those who decide to trust Him. If you're a believer and are working for the Lord, be sure that the Lord will reward you in His own time. You know, there's a great verse, Hebrews 6.10. For God is not unjust to forget your work and labor of love which you have shown towards his name and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. And we see this verse in action in Jeremiah 39 with Jeremiah and Ebed Melech. I'm not sure if I ever told you what Jeremiah means in Hebrew. It means whom Jehovah has appointed. And Ebed Melech means the servant of the king. And so are all who have received the Lord and his son in their heart. So they have been appointed and made servant of the king of kings. And God says, I'm going to take care of you. I will conclude with something I read about the history of the wall of China. That reminds me of our defenses actually as believers. You know, in, in history tells us that in ancient China, the people desired security from the barbaric hordes to the north. So they built the Great Wall of China. They built it so that it was too high to climb over, too thick to break down, and too long to go around. So they achieved this great work, and they felt much secured. The only problem was that during the first hundred years of the world's existence, China was invaded three times. Was the wall a failure? No, it was not, actually. For not once did the barbaric hordes climb over the wall, break it through, or go around it. How did they get inside China? The answer lies in the nature of men. The enemy simply bribed the gatekeeper, and then they marched through the gate. The fatal flaw of the Chinese defense was placing too much reliance on a wall and not putting enough effort into building the character of the gatekeeper. For the believer today, our strength, our success in this life lies in building up our character by walking with God through discipline, through work. It is then that our defenses will really be effective. Let's bow our head in prayer. While we praise you, Lord, we praise you, Heavenly Father, and we rejoice of the fact to be able to come to your presence and to know you better through your word and especially of these words that we find in the book of Jeremiah. Our hearts, minds, and mouth are full of thanksgiving as we say, bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Now bless us, Lord, and make us a blessing. Bless each member of our families. Guard us and guide us in matters great and small. And use us to extend and strengthen the kingdom for Yeshua and his glory. We pray in his name. Amen. May the Lord bless you.